Jefferson, Chair and CEO of Kaiser Permanente. Well, I've been involved in healthcare for more than three decades. I started with the financing side. I actually worked for a Blue Cross plan and I was in the uh, trained as an underwriter um, slightly more than three decades ago. And I evolved from the Blue Cross operation into running a small health plan, one of the first capitated health plans in America. Uh, that was HMO Minnesota. Um, we started the health plan with a network of participating clinics. And so I sort of evolved from uh, the insurance side of the operation into the care delivery side of the operation. And a little further down the road, I became the uh, CEO of a company uh, known as Health Partners. And Health Partners is a particularly interesting organization because it's a co-op. It's owned by the members, and Health Partners owns its hospitals and clinics. And so it's a very Kaiser-like organization. It, it's based on focusing on care delivery on the patient and delivering care through our own care network. So I've actually been uh, doing vertically integrated care now for decades. And that's relatively rare in America because most health insurance in America is based on more of a Blue Cross model where you just basically pay claims. And I've been now for two and a half decades involved in actually delivering care. Kaiser's different than just about everybody else in healthcare because we play all the positions in the game. We're a payer, we are a medical group, we're a hospital system, we own pharmacies, labs, imaging equipment, the, the entire spectrum. So when we think about care delivery, we think of it in the total context of, of everything, and we're prepaid. We get a budget from our members. They give us a premium. We use the premium to provide care. So we, we function much like a country. Uh, we're, we're about the size of, we're bigger than 140 countries and 42 states relative to our care population and our infrastructure. We have about 160,000 employees who deliver care. We have 40,000 nurses who work for Kaiser Permanente and take care of patients. So when we think about care delivery, we don't think about billing for individual units of care. We think about how we can function as a team to deliver care in the context of a total revenue stream focused on the patient, which is why we um, were an early adopter of electronic medical records. Because for us it made a huge amount of sense to have all of the information about all of the patients all of the time, whereas the rest of healthcare in this country tends to just have little bits and pieces of data about the care delivered in their site to their patients. What we have is all the information. So we, we put that on the computer and, and we basically invested four billion dollars in putting all of our information on electronic medical records. And it's working very well. Right now we have um, almost a paper-free environment. Our doctors have all of the information about all of the patients all of the time. So when the patient comes in, the doctor has all of the information that they, about the care they've delivered plus all the other care that anyone else has delivered. And that's very useful in making sure that we get the right care for the right patients. Now we feed that information into support systems and the support systems identify for given patients what the appropriate things are that we can do to support that patient. So there, there, it's a connected system in that regard. We've also connected with the patients um, directly by giving the electronic medical record to the patient. So if you were a Kaiser member, you could get your electronic medical record at home. More interestingly, I think, you could also connect electronically with your physician. So you could have an electronic visit. You could send an email to your doctor. Your doctor has all your information. And we started doing that in a secure messaging environment four years ago. We were up to a million e-visits in a year, three million e-visits the next year, six million this year. And by two years from now, about 40%, I think, of our primary care visits 
will be electronic, driven entirely by the patients. The patients love being able to do an e-visit. I had blood drawn um, a couple weeks ago, and I had it drawn in a clinic on, on the way to work. Got to the office, did my job. Late in the afternoon, I had an email from my doctor, and I had the lab results on my screen with an email from the doctor interpreting the results. The next day, I got an email from my cardiologist interpreting the results. I asked her a question, sent her the information. She sent me back an answer, and we had a dialogue totally electronically, and I ended up getting some follow-up information from her. And in the old world, that would have required multiple face-to-face -face visits. So I had, I had to stop in to draw blood because we couldn't do that electronically. But my doctor is on Alameda Island in San Francisco Bay, and he communicated with me. My cardiologist is in San Francisco across the bay. And again, three years ago, I would have had the drive to the island and wait in the waiting room and see the doctor and then get a referral to my cardiologist and then go to the cardiologist and wait in that waiting room. And instead I handled the whole thing at my computer. I got my questions answered and I actually had a printout with some information that I needed for follow-up electronically. Our members love that. Uh, if, you, if you ask Kaiser members who have been doing that to go back to the old system of having to drive in, have the face-to-face -face conversation with their doctor, we would have a rebellion. Um, and the doctors like it because it, it's a very convenient way of getting information to the patient um, and having a dialogue with the patient. The significant time saved because the, the physician actually can do several e-visits in the time that it would take to do one face-to-face -face visit, it's immensely efficient for the patient because you don't have to. I mean, I love Alameda Island, but it, there's a, a drawbridge. And so if I've got to go to my doctor in Alameda, I have to give myself time to get there. You know all the logistics. Get there, park, wait, go in the room, go through the registration, go through the, all the process, meet the physician, go out, leave, schedule the follow-up. And that, that whole process used to be done very manually. Now every single part of that I can do electronically. I can set up a visit. I can schedule a visit. If I need to do an appointment, I can schedule an appointment while I'm in. If I go f to see my physician face to face, my physician at Kaiser can not only um, have all my information, but they can also schedule me for a referral right there. Or even better, contact the referral doctor if I need to talk to an allergist and contact the allergist, and the allergist, might be in Modesto, can get on the phone with my primary care doctor. They can both look at the same screen at the same time and have a dialogue with me in the room and handle follow-up. So it, it's a far more efficient system. Um, and, our, and our patients like it a lot. Well, right out to the bat, if you just take the examples I was talking about, we had six million electronic visits. If we would have been a fee-for-service traditional uh, care delivery model, that means we gave up six million opportunities to bill. So the rest of the world is not rushing down that path. The rest of the world is not saying, uh, we also want to give up our, our opportunities to bill patients. And, if you look at the billing amount for a patient, that's 80 to $150 per bill that the rest of the world would give up. But because we're prepaid and we have the entire amount of money to work with, and it's our job to manage that money in the interest of the patient, we don't care uh, about the billing opportunities in the middle. The rest of the world does. The same thing is true in something like um, orthopedic. We put a program in place to deal with broken bones in our seniors and we we focused on seniors at high risk of breaking bones we made sure they had the right medication the right counseling the right training the right therapy the whole process supported by the computer supported by a nurse and doctor as a team and we cut the number of broken bones by 37 percent the we gave an award to the physicians who put that program together and they joked that they were in danger of losing their standing with their professional association because everybody else would have preferred to have 37% more 
broken bones to deal with. Likewise on the hospital side, for us it was just fine not to have all those admissions. Every other hospital in the world is out working to maximize admissions, which is why the American healthcare delivery system costs twice as much as any other delivery system in the world. We, we have the non-system of American healthcare is twice as expensive as the rest of the world because we not only have the perverse incentives to do multiple units of care, we also have the highest fee schedule in the world in America. A couple of numbers um, stand out. The fact that diabetes, 32% uh, of the cost of Medicare comes from diabetics. That's a huge percentage of Medicare cost. And yet we only get care right for diabetics in this country about 8% of the time. So if we took that 8 to 80, we could cut the complications of diabetes in America in half. And yet nothing is being done to move in that direction. Another number that stands out, 2% of the hospital patients in California have sepsis. When you look at the senior population and why people are dying in the hospital, 23% of the seniors in California die from sepsis. So 2% of the patients, 23% of the deaths. And no one is focusing on that. No one's doing anything about it. So those are the kinds of things. You look, you look at the total data set and you say somebody should be thinking this through. Somebody should be trying to figure out the right thing to do. Somebody should be focusing on the opportunities and putting programs in place. Inside KP, inside Kaiser Permanente, when we learned what the sepsis issues were, we focused on sepsis and we reduced the deaths by about 40%. Um, I think ultimately we'll reduce them by 50. But that's because we've taken a systematic approach to doing this that the rest of the country should do. You should not have 23% of any population dying of sepsis. It's wrong, in, but in every other hospital, those sepsis patients generate huge bills, $100,000 bills. So there's a perversity to the process that not only are there twice as many people with the condition, but the hospitals that have those patients are actually um, billing a lot of money for those cases. A, a perfect system is patient-focused. It's not built around the caregivers, it's not built around building opportunities, it's not built around revenue streams, it's built around the patient. So the perfect system focuses on the patient. And the perfect system has all of the information about each patient so that knowledgeable caregivers working with the patient can figure out what the optimal care pattern for that patient is. And if you're a healthy person and pre-diabetic, uh, the right plan for you is to avoid diabetes. If you have diabetes and you've got comorbidities, the right plan for you is a plan that links your caregivers and, and manages the complications. And everybody has a different perfect outcome, but everybody should have a care plan. Everyone should have somebody working with them, a care team, a support team, working with them to optimize their care outcomes. Perfect system can do that. An imperfect system, patients stumble into the emergency room, that's unconnected to anything else they do. They, they get care for their asthma in one place, they get care for their kidney failure in another place, completely unrelated care. Uh, imperfect system is built around the individual provider business sites and not around care. Perfect system has a data flow, has information going to the patients, has patients able to make informed choices. So when you've got one hospital that has a death rate for heart disease that's three or four times the next hospital over. Patients should know that. There should be an informed set of choices for patients. There's huge differences in oncology outcomes. If you have stage three cancer, your likelihood of living six months is significantly different depending on the oncologist you choose. Nobody knows that. If you have a mammogram read, the accuracy of the mammogram varies significantly based on the reader. Some readers have twice as many mammograms getting to stage three and death as other readers. And nobody knows that. People don't know that. So people assume I have a mammogram and protect it. So the perfect system would keep track of mammogram success rates, 
cancer survival rates, bone surgery success rates, if you just chart through the process, heart surgery success rates, and make that information part of the data flow the patients can use. So you need the right data, you need the right incentives, you need patient-focused care plans, and you put all that together, combine it with current medical science, and, and there's a great opportunity to do some really wonderful things for people. What we have instead is a siloed system. Now, we at Kaiser Permanente, because we're vertically integrated, can do a lot of this work now, and we are doing it. The rest of the world isn't vertically integrated, so it's harder to do a lot of those pieces. But what the rest of the world can do is virtual integration. If you can't be vertically integrated, you can still create integration links using the computer, care registries, data flows, and create care plans for patients and then provide feedback to that from other sources, like the claims processing system. If you go to the doctor and you have a claim filed on your behalf by the doctor, there's the diagnosis, there's the treatment, there's the cost of care, there's the person who did it, the time frames. Most of the information that's, that's in a medical record is in the claim. It's not timely, accuracy level's a little lower, it's not real time, but it's there. And so if you're having asthma attacks, multiple asthma attacks, that will show up in both the electronic medical record and the claims database. And right now, the electronic medical record can use it to make an improvement of care. The claims database is wasted. That data is not being used, and it could be used and should be used. So part of the American healthcare reform agenda should be to create access to that database and require everybody who pays for care in America to use that database and focus on issues like asthma care to make sure that every asthmatic basically ends up with at least a computer tracking their care and some kind of a care plan that will improve the asthma care. It makes huge sense to have as much alignment as you can possibly get between the revenue stream and the care delivery. And, and so we, we need to reward the best providers for being the best providers. Some, some processes are very individual, like knee surgery, typically involves a knee surgeon and a patient, and doesn't involve quite a few other areas, although there are um, therapists involved in the recovery. Other conditions like uh, diabetes take an entire team of caregivers. And so you need a team coordination, a team data flow, a team reward system. And the very best payers ought to reward and partner with teams of caregivers for the chronic conditions and then create a marketplace that rewards the best performance by the individual performers. And if you did both of those things, you would have better knee surgery and better diabetic care. And if, you, if the insurance company stands back from that whole process and isn't part of it relative to the benefit package or data flow, information flow, channeling patients to the best providers, I think that does the patients a disservice because that, that teamwork should be there and that partnership should be there. So the ideal model going forward is a linked model. And also there are quite a few vertically integrated care systems in America that ought to be thinking about stepping up to the plate and taking prepayment, much like Kaiser. And I think as we go forward, depending on health, how health care reform shakes out, that could happen. I think there's an understanding, actually, on the part of President Obama, some of the key Senate leaders, some of the key House leaders, that the care delivery system is not organized optimally right now and that we ought to be working toward a better model. And I think there's an appreciation of team care. I think there's an appreciation of data flows, data sets, data tracking, um, informed patient choice. I mean, I think all of that is, is in the air, but it's not sufficiently in the bills. And so we've had discussions, conversations, hearings about those kinds of issues. And then when the bills finally got written, some of those pieces didn't get incorporated. But when, even when Senator Baucus did his hearing the other day, 
for his press conference and he talked about how he would like to see healthcare organized in the future, one of the things he cited was us, uh, Mayo, Cleveland Clinic, Geisinger, some of the other care systems and, and said it would be good for America to reorganize and to move down those paths. I think though that the, the way America can get there is not by trying to reorganize the system from, from that perspective, it's by saying we need to fix a couple things in this country. We need to have half as many kids with asthma attacks. We need to figure out how do we put all the pieces in place to get there. And if we set a goal like that, diagnose every kid, make sure that every kid has a treatment plan, make sure there's a database, make sure you're tracking what happens to every kid. When you put all of those pieces in place, they lend themselves to a system. And because you can't achieve those things unless you have tools, data, information, somebody accountable. So if we set a few goals for the country and then work backward from the goals to the plan, I think, and take that very seriously and then have reward systems based on achieving those plans, I think what will happen then was well, there would be a natural gravitation of caregivers into more tightly organized and coordinated care teams. But that's not going to happen until there's a reason to do it. The caregivers aren't going to reorganize just for the, the theory of it or, or because somebody gave a nice speech and it sounded good or because Mayo has a great brand or we have a great brand. They, they're going to do it if they're, because doing it makes it more likely that they will cut the number of congestive heart failure attacks in half. And if they do that, if they band together to do that and are rewarded for doing that, that model will work. So I think we've got to get there. Goal first, rewards, tools, and then I think there will be an aggregation that will come out of it, but it will be an aggregation that results from the goal, um, not one that creates the outcome. You know, if, you, if you look in any other business, if you look in any, if you go to a factory, there are no factories in the world that will build a tool and throw the tool randomly into the factory and hope that somebody picks it up and, and uses it in some smart way. Every factory says, this is the product we want. We want to produce this hubcap. We want this hubcap to have a 99.9% .9 lack of variability. Okay, to do that, what do the tools have to be? And then they work backward from the hubcap to the toolkit. Healthcare is the only thing that throws a new wrench in and says, I hope somebody in there uses it and somehow in the end the hubcap's better. It doesn't work. So we have to start. We have to start with a hubcap. We have to start with the outcome. We have to cut the number of congestive heart failure patients or the number of asthma attacks and then build the toolkit from that. And then the benefit package that Blue Cross pays has to reward those outcomes. Because if they ignore the outcomes or do as we do now and actually reward perverse outcomes, care delivery will not change. Healthcare in this country responds very quickly incentives. So if you created a care environment where the care teams who cut the number of asthma attacks in half win, get more money, get more patients, benefit. If you created a situation where the care teams that have half as many kidney failures win, everybody will gravitate to that model. Healthcare providers are very, very smart. You don't get through medical school or hospital administration school without being very smart. So everybody very carefully studies the compensation system and understands exactly what's rewarded and what's not. And if you try to force people into teams just for the sake of putting them in teams and there's no reward involved and there's no positive outcome, people won't go to teams. But if you create a reward system that rewards the result of teams, then people will figure 50 very creative ways to form the teams. And so it has to be on the results. You've got to build the architecture, as every other market does, on the product that's sold. You know, think about cell phones. The, the cell phone market is based on the product that's sold. You could not sell a cell phone today of the kind that we used three, four years ago in the market because that's not what people want to buy today. And so the, the cell phone market is constantly changing, constantly improving because they're rewarded by the change. They're not, they're not changing 
because they like to change. They're changing because they're trying to get to that next market share and because there's a win for them by coming up with a better phone. They engineer the better phone. There is no win in healthcare right now for coming up with a better outcome. There is none. There's actually a loss. And so you've got to change that. That has to change. And healthcare people are just as smart as cell phone engineers. So if you change that, then the entire system will follow that. And that's where the change has to happen. And it's got to be in rewarding a different set of outcomes. And then people will organize differently, put toolkits in place to get to those outcomes. Consumers need to be brought into the picture in a couple of areas. And, and one of them is when you're looking at something like knee surgery, back surgery, um, even cancer survival rates, if you've got consumers armed with sufficient data to make informed decisions about the best caregivers, they will make those decisions. If you had stage three lung cancer and you knew there was a difference in survival rate between three different oncology groups in town, would you or would you not use that data to pick an oncology group? Of course you would. And what would happen if that happened? That oncology group would get better and the other ones would catch up. And you'd have a different market in oncology. Right now you have no clue. If you have stage three lung cancer, you don't have a clue. You don't know who to pick. You know who's got the best reputation, but you don't know if they have the best outcomes. And study after study has shown that organizations with the best reputations often don't have the best outcomes. Some of the heart surgery survival rates show that the institutions that everybody thought were the absolute premier institutions had a death rate that was double, tripled some of the other. And so you need the data, and if you've got that data, you'll make informed choices. That's part of the market. The second thing is, if you've got a chronic condition, you need to have appropriate incentives to go to the right team of caregivers and to work with those caregivers and getting your care. And that's where the benefit package needs to reward you and incent you and, and channel you to the best caregivers. And the caregivers then need to be rewarded for best care. And if you put those two pieces together, you can give people to the right caregivers. Right now, there are no incentives, no channeling, no direction, no data. Nothing is pushing people toward the best caregivers. And so people who want the best caregivers don't even know where to go. And part of the problem with medical savings accounts, at the very bottom level, the, the concept of having people make value-based choices is not a bad concept. The problem is people have no data to use. They don't know who's going to give them the best knee surgery. They don't know who's going to give them the best anything. There's no data. And so the medical savings accounts, as an incentive for better care, have pretty much failed. As, as an incentive to get people not to buy certain kinds of things. They've had some success. And the, the, the challenge is, if you've got somebody with a chronic condition who's not getting their appropriate treatments, because the deductible, that's a very bad thing. And so the, there's a, a uh, architecture to that process that needs to be done really well. But medical savings accounts on their own didn't create informed decision-making on the part of consumers because there's no information. I mean, if, if Medicare, with all of its information, can't make informed decisions about the best caregivers, why would a consumer with a thousand dollar deductible suddenly be magically empowered to make that kind of decision? We actually need data. We need to track outcomes. We need to track care delivery. We need information about the entire care delivery infrastructure. We need to know which kids are having asthma attacks. Ideally, you've got electronic medical record in real time. But what we do at Kaiser Permanente, we have an electronic medical record. It's real time in the doctor's office. When, when I had an x-ray on my shoulder, walked down the hallway, by the time I got to the end of the hallway, the doctor already had the x-ray up on the screen because it was all digital and it was enlarging it and showing me the little bone spur in my shoulder. I mean, that, that kind of thing is you know, sort of optimal. The rest of the world isn't going to be there for a while, but what the rest of the world can do is take that electronic claims database and follow up on the patients with chronic conditions and identify who's having complications and then make sure the ones with complications are channeled into care teams and use the benefit package to channel people into care teams and, and also use the, um, 
One of the things that some people experimenting in India have done that's been very successful is instead of changing the benefits, because you don't want to give a person who's not getting their chronic care needs met a higher deductible because then they're just less likely to get it met. But if you say to the person, which they've done in, in India, you're not doing the right things to, for your chronic care needs and therefore the amount that we take out of your paycheck every month is going to go from 40 bucks to 80 bucks. And it's going to stay at 80 until, in, in a, the model in India was until people had their blood sugar managed appropriately. Anyone whose blood sugar went beyond a certain uh, percentage if you were diabetic paid double the premium until the blood sugar came back in line. And guess what? Blood sugar came back in line because people didn't like to have the money taken out of their paycheck. I'm not sure we could do that type of thing explicitly in America, but it is that kind of thing that you need to be doing to get the patients who have those conditions into the right care settings and then reward those care settings with both volume and fair payment so that that's the business model of American healthcare. We need to change the business model of American healthcare to produce what we want it to produce. We need a national culture of health. We need to say, we need people to eat differently, we need a higher activity level. There are certain things that we know we need people to smoke less. There are certain things we know will really have an impact on health. The, the numbers are overwhelming. The, the relationship between obesity and heart disease and diabetes is stunning. And now there's really good evidence showing that your likelihood of having Alzheimer's doubles if your cholesterol level is high in your 40s. And so if, you're, if your Alzheimer's risk goes up, if your heart disease risk, there's all kinds of reasons pushing us toward um, healthier attitudes. Finland, a decade ago, had the worst health in Europe. Highest cholesterol levels, most obesity, and most heart attacks, most diabetes. Start through the process. Finland was absolutely the least healthy country. They adopted a national culture of health. Their leaders promoted it, their schools promoted it, their businesses promoted it. They changed eating habits, they went through a whole series of things. They are now 20% below the European average on those issues. They've gone from the top to way down at the bottom just by, as a country, being absolutely conscious about it, talking to everybody about it, making it a national goal. It's a very small country, but it's a, it's a really impressive result. And if you look at the lines, actually, in, uh, I think the last chapter of my book, I think, has the Finnish success chart in, and shows what an incredible difference they have made in that country by uh, making that a national initiative. If President Obama and the Congress said, we're going to create a national culture of health in America, and we're going to cut the number of diabetics in America in half in five years or ten years, we could do it. The, the biology is there, the science is there, the approaches are there. It's not rocket science. We wouldn't have to inject everybody with something. We could get there, but we're not going to get there unless it becomes a national initiative and unless somebody calls for us to go down that path, but we should, and, and it would be a huge mistake not to. I think we need two steps in the current process. I, I don't think we should think of it as just one big leap from here to where we're going. It, it's a two-step process. And the first step is we have to get everybody covered. We have to have universal coverage. We have to have all the kids in America in a database where we can deal with asthma issues. We have to have everybody insured. That, that's the first stage. So we have to make that affordable. And the second thing, and we have to do this very quickly, is we then have to improve care. Because we cannot afford the care trajectory we're on. We can't afford to have twice as many people with kidneys failing. We can't afford to have 23% of the people dying of sepsis in hospitals. That's a trajectory we can't afford. We've got to fix that second. One bill can't fix both. One bill can't do all the insurance reform and do the care improvement reform. So it's got to be a bill and a bill. It's got to be a bill and an, and an agenda, a bill and a leadership. And that's the model we have to use. And you can't get there just in one jump. And the, the hearings a year ago in the Senate were trying to deal with both of those issues at the same time, 
And there were some very good conversations going on about the chronic care issues in America and the need to fix chronic care. And then there was a sense as we were trying to figure out what's step one and step two, that we have to get to step one as being the insurance part of the agenda and the coverage. But step two has to follow immediately thereafter. It can't follow two years from now or five years from now. It has to follow months from now. And we need to jump on that agenda and fix a couple of those key issues and get people on path to do that. And I think America is ready for that. I think America is ready to get healthier, but we have to be led there. Number one, we've got to get those issues out of the way. We, if we try to fix diabetic care for the country, and we've got 30 million people, many of whom have high diabetic needs, not covered, we can't do it. If we've got all those kids who have the, the terrible asthma care not covered in a care system, out of a care system, in an insurance plan, out of a care system, we can't fix asthma care. I mean, we can't do step two until we do step one. We've got to get everybody covered. Everybody in this country has to have access to care. Then we need to fix care. But we need to fix it now. We need not fix it 10 years from now. I mean, we know now what needs to be done for asthmatics. We know what needs to be done for people with congestive heart failure. We know what those issues are. We just have to get to them. But we can't get to them until everybody has insurance. If somebody does not have an insurance plan and they have congestive heart failure, who or what could possibly make their care better? Nothing. You've got to do step one, step two. And if you think we're going to somehow playing with a horrible handicap, playing left-handed and blindfolded, without everybody covered, we're going to fix care, and then after we fix care, we're going to come back and fix insurance? Anybody who does that has never actually, anybody who thinks that way has never actually been involved in either care delivery or care financing. Kaiser Permanente, we can't fix care for the people who don't have coverage, but we can do a lot for the people who have coverage. Most of Europe provides universal coverage and uses private health plans and an employer-based system. So if you're in the Netherlands, a percentage of your paycheck goes to your health care benefit and you choose from 120 health plans. And you pick the health plan and that health plan must take you. It's, a, it's an individual mandate, the health plan must take you. No health screening. If you're in Switzerland, your employer deducts part of your paycheck and you, you get a health plan. There are 70 health plans in Switzerland. You get to choose among them. Germany has 300 health plans. Everybody in Germany picks a private plan. Those countries have no government system of any kind. They do not have anything resembling Medicare, Medicaid, anything. They just basically have private health plans and an employer-based system. And the employers use their leverage as purchasers to get better deals for their workers and also to get um, health improvement agendas and health spas and that type of thing. So if you're in, in Germany, uh, the employers will negotiate like spa treatments, that type of thing, on top of the, the uh, basic health benefits for workers. So involving employers in the, in the model works just fine as long as care is affordable. All those countries deduct from the paycheck. If you, even if you go to France, where they have a mixed system, the France system looks an awful lot like the Medicare, Medicare supplement model in the U.S. Everybody has a basic benefit package from the government, but it's low. So 92% of the people buy private insurance. And that private insurance pays the difference between what the government pays and, and uh, what the doctors charge. And again, that model is done by employer. And France actually has many healthcare co-ops, and many employers, municipalities will get together, create a co-op, libraries will get together, create a co-op. There's a whole bunch of co-ops in France, and, and, and the French co-ops purchase care for workers, but again, it's a worker-based system, and everybody pays a portion of their paycheck to buy it. So most of Europe is, is a payroll deduction, just like Medicare in the U.S. Social Security in the U.S., they use the same model in, in those countries, and then you get to choose between health plans. So having employers in the link can be done, um, and it works just fine. The problem in the U.S., 
the way it's the reason it's failed here is because in those countries every employer must be in. In the U.S., it's optional. Some are in, some are out. Um, you, you, workers don't know if they're going to have health coverage. There's an inconsistency to the American model that doesn't exist in those other countries. But having employers in um, can be done just fine. I've spent a lot of time um, looking at foreign models. I actually um, chaired this year the health governors at the World Economic uh, Congress in Davos, and I'm the current chair of the International Federation of Health Plans, and that's health plans from 80 countries around the world. And so I meet all the time with health plans from, from those other countries. And I've been looking uh, hard to figure out which attributes of those plans would fit in the U.S. And one of the things I've learned from working with all those countries is that every single one does it a little differently. So the model in Germany looks a lot like the Netherlands, but it's not quite the same. Austria, different than both those, but, but quite similar. In fact, the model that Governor Schwarzenegger uh, proposed in California last year looks uh, suspiciously like the Austrian model. Uh, the, the, every country does it slightly differently. But if I were going to pick a model that I think um, would, would transplant well, it, it's actually the Dutch model. I think the Dutch have done some really good things. And the thing that they have added to their model more recently is a risk adjuster between the health plans. So when the health plans go out and, and recruit members and enroll people, uh, the government in the end does a, a, an assessment of who got the healthy people and who got the less healthy people. And if any health plan got a disproportionate number of healthy people, they have to actually pay some money back into the pool. And any health plan got too many sick people, they get more money from the pool. And so what that does is strongly encourage, as we were saying earlier, the health plans to go after the sicker people and do a really good job taking care of sick people because they know in the end they get a risk adjuster from the other plans that enrolled healthier people. So I think the Dutch model of, of having uh, you know, payroll deduction, individual choice of health plans, and then a risk adjuster in the back end has a lot to offer. It's a federal model. They basically, in the end of the year, run the core information about each health plan. How many diabetics do they have? How many congestive heart failure patients? How many asthmatics? They sort through the whole thing. And then basically run a formula, and if you have enrolled a disproportionate number of people with those expensive diseases and a high level of, of morbidity, they um, increase your payment, or if it's a low level, decrease your payment. And, and actually, we do that to some degree in this country on our Medicare Advantage program. There's already, we have a risk adjuster formula that works in America. It's a pretty good formula. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than no formula. And so we, we already have a history of doing that. We could, we could adapt to the Dutch model fairly easily. The fact that we now understand how important it is for caregivers to be connected and that we now have the toolkit necessary to do that. A few years ago, you couldn't connect anyone because there were no linkages, the internet didn't exist. Um, the, the ability of, of uh, information to flow freely didn't exist. And, and I think right now, there's a sense that if you do the right job for patients with comorbidities, you can seriously make their lives better. And there's a toolkit that exists to do that. And I think it's very exciting. That The other thing that I'm really excited about is the fact that medical science is going to get a lot better with data. I mean, we now know that patients who had a certain type of, of belly fat 25 years ago are more likely to have Alzheimer's. We know that certain cholesterol levels have a long-term impact of Alzheimer's. We know there's a whole series of things that we now know from looking at databases that we could not have possibly known before we had the longitudinal database. And we're going to be taking DNA, and we're going to have, one of our projects is going to have DNA on about 500,000 people. So it's going to be a huge database. We're going to tie the DNA database to the electronic medical record. And then we're going to start looking for correlations, and we're going to discover things, and we're going to learn. And we're going to learn things right now that we don't even suspect. There's going to be a learning that's going to come out of that. I think it's going to be extremely powerful, and when that happens, then we can start focusing optimal care on patients in a very important way. So that gives me 
great confidence in, and it's very exciting. And I think we're very close to a golden age. We're very close to a medical science golden age that is only empowered by data. Most medical research projects right now have 200 patients, 300 patients, they run for three years and they stop. If you look at the kind of medical research that's out there, it's tiny samples for short time frames. And we're going to have the ability to do massive samples and extended time frames and figure things out that you can't figure out without that. So that, that's very exciting. A couple pieces of advice. One is pay attention. Uh, understand very, very clearly what's happening in your environment, in your organization. Um, don't work out of theory or past practice or history, but have a really clear sense of what's actually happening right now and make sure that if there's any barriers to the truth getting to you that you knock them down or get them out of the way. So that, that's one step. The, the second thing is you should always be looking out to the horizon. You should be looking out over the horizon and have a three to five year uh, planning horizon and know that if things go well, here's where we want to be five years from now. And to get there, here's the things we have to do in four years, three years, two years, and then build your agenda around that. And don't build it around being responsive to the crisis of now. You have to deal with the crisis of now. The crisis of now is now. And so that has to be dealt with. But if you deal with the crisis of now, and you know where you want to be five years from now, you may go this way instead of that way to get around it. And that's critically important. So you, you need to understand where you're going, and you need to pay attention. So if I were giving people advice, those are the two pieces of advice I would give.